Good evening. The news gang is here tonight. Variants, vaccines, and now a job for senior citizens. Is there an end in sight? An outbreak of alliances, or oh, is it? Ruto is speaking, Raila is missing in action, and a new political union is born. We'll take a closer look. Also on the show, the MCS couldn't change even a comma. Now the MPs could change it all. And the courts are waiting in the wings. Is the BBI reggae playing off key? Just ask the IBC chair on the punchline tonight how to make those sneaky COVID-19 nighttime revelers useful during the day. The memo is Jamila's success card for the gallant candidates of 2021. The kicker is on lessons from Tanzania we never learned. And on the angle tonight, a plea for soft leadership as Suluhu Hassan begins her reign. My view, like uh, the gang <laughs> on citizen television, my view is Serena Grounds, a wonderful historic grounds. And what God has enabled us to do today, we'll live, we'll live in the annals of the history of this country as truly momentous and historic. Yes, that gang he talked about is this one. <laughs> In our sign language, uh, gangster. gangster. Is Wilson Mushara is going to be helping us throughout this show. Um, that press conference by Kalonzo Musioka and, uh, and his new coalition uh, colleagues will, will be part of our discussion later on. But uh, lady and gentlemen, I should say, Yvonne is off tonight and uh, we hope to have her back next week. The whole question of COVID-19, we have seen uh, alarming numbers this week, Jamila. I will start mm -hmm. with you. We've seen uh, the positivity rate yo-yoing somewhere between 16, 17, sometimes even going to 22%. And the number of deaths reported this month, I think over 200, if I'm not mistaken. And um, something seems to be off the rails. Of course, today the government announcing that they're expanding that vaccination bracket now to include uh, persons aged 58 and above, um, what's going on? Um, Joe, you're right. Uh, this month alone, we've had 236 deaths and over 20,700 new infections of, of COVID-19. In fact, uh, March is uh, coming close to, to the highest month we recorded, which was November, uh, in terms of infections and, and, and deaths. And, and, and as you said, it's worrying, as we had been told that we're in the third wave. Yes, we have vaccines being given. Uh, it's been slightly over two weeks since um, we started giving up the vaccines. And uh, the issue of vaccines hesitancy has come up or the slow uh, up uptake of vaccine has come up because as of yesterday 64,100 people had been uh, vaccinated against a target of 1.2 to be met by June and and the ministry says oh they're trying to increase uptake to have up to about 20,000 people in uh, vaccinated in a day I don't know if we'll get there because there are a lot of issues surrounding the vaccine hesitancy I think the assumption the government had uh, in the beginning was that the healthcare workers will rush and, and be vaccinated uh, as soon as the vaccines are available and that is not being seen in in counties you hear uh, them saying that we're not going to get it for various reasons and and among them i think is basically communication uh this is not the first time that the government is is doing a vaccine targeted vaccine program we've had mm. polio in the past when we've even had them going all the way to the community level sensitizing and and talking about the importance of, of vaccine we have community health workers who are really good at this and i'm not sure that they are really engaged in terms of now giving information about the vaccine that is one of the main things that should have been done uh when we were, we, we were getting the AstraZeneca vaccine in the country, that's one and two. Uh, the fact that now people, they realize now oh, that eight people age 58 and above should be vaccinated because they're saying uh, those dying, 60% of those who are dying in the country are people in this age bracket, which mm -hmm. is well and good. But then now going forward, what next? Vaccines will expire, uh, I think in the, in the, what, the next three months or so, and we do not want to have brought in 1.1 million vaccines and have half of it expiring. Mm -hmm. And people who are able, who are supposed to be getting this vaccine should go ahead and get it. I was speaking to a doctor and he told me it gives you 100% um, some sort of protection. I'm not saying 100% protection from getting COVID, but 100% protection of not ending up dying from COVID related complications or 100% protection of not ending up in the wards 
in HDU or ICU because you're unable to, to breathe. But it gives you some fighting chance. That's what the doctor said. It gives you at least a chance to be able to fight the disease if you have the vaccine in you. So there are all these myths going around. Someone was telling me he's not going to get the vaccine because he's been told it can cause impotency, among other things. So I think the failure was in the part of the government in terms of giving education about this vaccine, what it means and why people should go get it, number one. Number two, it's not too late. This communication can go out and people can be told the importance of getting this vaccine so that we can get it because it's available now. And, 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 and Lina's uh, talking of communication, I mean, initially it was really, uh, you could tell when, when, for example, the first case was, was, was noted in Kenya and then there were all these campaigns. I mean, everywhere you went, you felt that there was something in the air, there was something going on. And right now, I mean, vaccine uh, all over the world, there's always all this controversy about them. But what deals with it is actually very targeted, serious strategic communication that tackles all of these things that people might be throwing all over the place. I mean, um, social media is not making it any better. Which is what we should be seeing, uh, Joe, strategic communication, very aggressive communication, very consistent communication, informing the public and uh, persuading uh, that this vaccination exercise is very, very important. Uh, we all remember very well when it comes to, say, the polio campaign, the communication is absolutely fantastic, whether from the Ministry of Health or even the public health officials on the ground. That is the level of communication that we may require to see the Ministry of Health engaging in going forward. They need to speak out. Because here is one thing, and uh, Jamila has correctly uh, uh, cited it out there, there is a very long history of vaccine hesitancy. In the 1800s, governments had to resort to legislation. Then 1853 uh, Vaccination Act in England made it mandatory that you have to vaccinate the child who is under, under three months. So we should know that this is the space as well. Look at the trends in the initial weeks of the vaccination. I think when we sat here, I think a week after the, it landed, we only reported around uh, 10,000 uh, vaccination that, that day. And um, we were told and we could observe that even the medics themselves were not very enthusiastic about uh, getting the vaccine. And the simple reason to uh, this hesitancy has been, let's see, how does it work? What is the effect of it? Um, does it make someone sick? Will you survive after taking this uh, vaccination? All these questions, none of this should be taken for granted or dismissed or taken lightly by the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health will need to pick some of these things that are going out there and coming up with a communication uh, strategy that then answers those concerns. Uh, remember not too long ago we had a lady here we covered uh, who had lost her husband to uh, COVID-19. And she said, no, I'm not going to touch the vaccine until I hear from the church. Because this is the trend generally. In society, there'll be that person or that organization or that institution that will have a voice uh, over you, that will persuade you in terms of um, some of these things. For that lady, the Catholic Church, the voice of the Catholic Church is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And it mattered very much that only a week after that, we had uh, the Catholic bishops saying we are fine with the vaccine. So there's a lot of this communication that we need to start having. And uh, Joe, look, this could be with us for a while. We don't know when uh, COVID-19 will be uh, defeated. We don't know how many vaccination exercises we will need going forward. What there needs to be constant is very good communication from the Ministry of Health. Now it is AstraZeneca. Tell us about everything. Respond to all these questions that the public uh, are raising. And then encourage people to actually uh, go in there and get vaccinated. It was very, very good to hear the ministry today saying that it is now open for the f uh, above 58 years old. Mm -hmm. And that's good communication. And we need to hear that going forward in terms of a structured uh, approach to this vaccination. And they, and they gave a reason. Actually, they were saying, uh, Francis, that 60% of the deaths that have been noted so far actually came from that 
age, age age group, yeah. you know, 58, 58 and above. And, and this whole <coughs> confusion about vaccines needs to be uh, cleared. I mean, I know, for example, in places like uh, northern Nigeria, there have been um, instances in the past where there have been uh, a lot of campaigns waged by different groups against vaccines, and that had a real impact. There's a whole generation of people who had polio just because there had been uh, all these campaigns that were waged by uh, some religious groups in northern Nigeria at the time. So, so these things can have actual consequences on, on, on the people. And, and then yesterday we hear about the, the Russian vaccine mm -hmm. and the whole confusion again where on the one hand we start seeing ads uh, floating around mm -hmm. that you know you can come and get your job at 8,000 bob and then the next thing the ministry is saying no, 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 actually we haven't quite approved that. It's still going through, through the processes. And that, that sort of thing uh, is not very reassuring. Pessimism. And it has some roots. Um, you remember when we first talked about COVID-19 in, in this country last year, I think in March or thereabout, and immediately after there was you know, a lot of caution and people ex exercising a lot of caution. And then all of a sudden we started hearing mamas and you know what you call fununu of certain things not going right. Some people started doubting the numbers and so on and so forth. And then thereafter, when we <laughs> right here talked about the likelihood of COVID millionaires, which came to be a reality, um, it sent some questions around. And now, is there a likelihood of vaccine millionaires? Most likely, maybe. And these are some of the issues that I would say make it difficult even um, even for the most noble of ideas like the vaccination and everything else, people still have some pessimism. And there are still some answer, unanswered questions relating to how COVID-19 items were procured um, in the last one year. There are still pending uh, questions. And when you see sittings in parliament where people are saying all manner of stories and giving us what one can say are stories of giant or cook, cock and bull stories, then people start doubting. But it is important at this point in time to explain to Kenyans what is this vaccine about, answer every question that they have. In this particular matter, there would be no foolish question. Answer every question that is coming your way, especially for the government and the ministry particularly. Build confidence. Let people buy in. Let people be confident that what they are being told about the vaccine is correct, um, is workable, and it is genuine, and it is efficient. And it is important to start from one place to another. Convince the medical workers, convince the religious leaders, convince the political leaders, convince what you call the opinion leaders in, 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 in local areas, in villages, so to say, so that they can spread the gospel of vaccination across the country. Because there are some people, for example, who, much as they believe there is COVID, much as they would want a solution, they will still want to hear what their pastor or their imam will say about it. So convince them, you know, buy in, build a lot of goodwill, and by so doing, it will work. And then also deal with all these questions, the anxiety, the pessimism that is coming in, the skepticism. It is important to deal with all these things and deal with them from an individual point of view to a holistic point of view. Ultimately, there will be a good a uh, and Not in a dismissive way. I mean, yeah, there's, a, a dismissive there's, way. there's a sense in which sometimes, you know, uh, I've had uh, when they do the communication, they just dismiss like, no, 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 that one cannot be true and everything. And, and, and you know, with communication, a lot of these things are very emotional. Mm -hmm. Whoever spreads uh, myths and everything, they appeal to the emotion. They scare people. They terrify you. So when you start thinking about this thing, you have all these ideas of monsters and ogres in your head that actually someone needs to tackle those things uh, at that level. And I've, I've seen that happening a, a, a lot in this country. But the other thing I think which, uh, uh, Francis, you mentioned, which is uh, absolutely on the money, is this whole idea of mapping out who are the key points of opinion in this country. Mm -hmm. Who are the opinion 
leaders, the opinion shapers in the entire spectrum of the country. Remember when they had that Huduma number and they enlisted even the political leaders, they have billboards and all of these things. And every Kenyan listens to somebody, whoever that person mm -hmm. is. There are people who listen Whether to... Whether right or wrong. Yes, there are people who listen to politicians. If politician A says this thing is okay, then it is okay. There are others who listen to their pastors and priests and other religious leaders that speak to their lives. And those are important. So in terms of getting this thing off the other side, it is about enlisting all these opinion leaders and making sure that you're on the same page. So that when they go speaking to their various publics in society, it, it begins to make sense. I Jamila. think, Joe, if, if that works, and that's our hope and prayer, that they listen to all these voices, that all these voices will be involved in trying to encourage people to get the vaccine, and people do get the vaccine, and then Zishe. So what? What happens next? Because um, a lot of people are saying, well, I've gotten the first one, and I'm expected to get the second one in eight weeks. And what if we don't have any in eight weeks? There are those who say, oh, you can get any other that are available. But they're not really tests to show what happens to a body. If, let's say, you had AstraZeneca as the first job, and then you get maybe Pfizer as the second one. That's besides the point. What we need to look at as a country now is where can we get more vaccines? Yes, we have a plan. But I think 90% of the vaccines we're expecting until 2023 is Zakupatiwa, especially under this COVAX agreement that we have. We are thinking which, maybe, is, which is running into which a problem is running right into a problem now because of what because India the, has said. The, the Serum Institute, yes, the Serum Institute of India, which um, I think has given about 11 point 17, about 17 million doses to COVAX yeah. so far. They're temporarily halting export of uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine because of the increasing number of infections in their own country, India. And where does that leave countries like Kenya, who are depending on, mm. on, on, on the COVAX uh, initiative to get vaccine to be able to give to its people? I think that's why they should try and open doors now to others, like now the Sputnik 5. They're saying its efficacy is about 92%. And um, I, was, I was listening to the report yesterday and they said that it should cost about 11,000 shillings, 5,500 for the first dose and 5,500 21 days later. Yes, not many Kenyans can afford that. And maybe they should look up at maybe bringing it at a lower price so that a bit more people can get the infection. They should open doors for even Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, which is just one dose. Because once this runs out and maybe for some reason we're unable to get any more considering that what India has announced, maybe we may be in trouble in terms of how much vaccine will be available. Look at countries like, like the US. I was, I, I was reading like globally, I was looking at a report that was done by Bloomberg. About 486 million doses have been given in about 137 countries. The US alone has had more Americans who have received at least one dose of the vaccine than those who have tested positive. About 130 million doses of the vaccine have been given. That is in countries like the US who are able to afford to buy enough vaccine or more than enough vaccine than they need. But we are not in that space at all. And we should try and look at options of vaccines that we can give to the people if we, depending on AstraZeneca only, maybe we will be in more trouble than, than we think. But Jamila, yeah. isn't it a better problem yeah. if we had dealt with the stock of one million plus Fast. that you already have, mm -hmm. and then we are looking for additions as opposed to a scenario where, mm -hmm. as at now, I think three weeks later, yes. we're talking about 40,000 people. 64 actually. 64,000 yes. people. Yes. I mean, isn't it a better problem to deal with the you know, the expectation, the the turnout that is huge um, uh, for the time being. Because if if you're talking about three weeks and we had 64,000, and then it, it, it says something. I mean, I would even probably suggest open up the field. Mm -hmm. Let those who are excited about the vaccination come and get it. Mm -hmm. So that you deal with a better problem of looking for more when you have already vaccinated the number of people who have turned up mm -hmm. as opposed to a scenario where you have stocks you have fear you have pessimism you have skepticism and eventually you have not dealt with the matter at hand COVID-19. Which is why this communication and all those efforts you're talking about involve others in trying to convince people to get the vaccine Correct. is important. Their expectation had been by end of June the 1.2 million vaccines that we have to Asia. but as you say we're nowhere near that. Yeah. But there is a possibility. I mean, we are Kenyans. There is this possibility of an overnight. Last minute rush. La remember how we register, for, we do for, we do anything. Um, there can be this sudden change of mind. The hesitation ends. And then we end up with that problem that um, we have more people than the doses that are uh, available. And there is one thing that should least worry us, and that is the quality of uh, mm -hmm. communication that is coming out of uh, uh, the Ministry of, of, of Health. 
I mean, I mean there is a lot that can be uh, given to them in terms of uh, how they've communicated between March last year and 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 and, and early this uh, early this year. Only that this is a new space again. Vaccine is a new space. And what could they be grappling with uh, there as well at policy level? They are grappling with the questions you are raising, uh, Jamila. Should we open and say we bring in um, uh, other vaccines, not just the, the ones under COVAX? These are the questions that they are going to have to uh, answer. And even as they do this, Joe, we are talking of infections that are really, really increasing. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there have been speculation that there could be a statement by uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta uh, tomorrow. Uh, Francis, I don't know uh, whether this is <laughs> Some guys are asking me, Francis, some guys are asking me, come on, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I Francis, think it is just, a legitimate... Francis, just tell us. At the time, I'm not It is a legitimate expectation uh, from Kenyans to hear from <laughs> Uh, the president, and it was very interesting to see what uh, the Kenya Private Sector Alliance uh, did today. Yes, mm -hmm. very bold statement out there, complete with proposals that we want a partial sort of lockdown uh, in terms of travel restrictions, uh, social gatherings. They also spoke about um, reducing the hours of the... Yeah, yeah. In, in, in yeah. increasing the curfew in, hours. Increasing the curfew hours, rather. Yeah. And bringing forward the hour from 10 o'clock to, to, to 9 o'clock. To, 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 ni to 9, nine o'clock. It's very, very interesting. We should um, all really look forward, and I think Kenyans are looking forward to hearing from President Kenyatta tomorrow. I don't know whether there will be that speech or not, but... What I know is that the numbers are not looking good. Um, uh, my colleague Sam Gituku and I were looking at uh, the numbers in the last 10 days, and you're talking about close to 200 deaths in two, mm. in two weeks. Yes, yeah. it's yeah. Yeah, and, and as that now, you're talking about um, 126,170 cases. So cumulatively, 1.4 million tests. But more... Uh, and and 20,000 infections in March alone. Absolutely. And look at the numbers. The number of We've talked about the number of deaths, but there's one specific place that people are really talking about, other than the fatalities that, have, that are now at 2,092. We have a whole 1,080 people admitted in various hospitals, but particularly 121 patients who are in intensive care unit, 35 of whom are on ventilatory support, and 77 on supplemental oxygen. These are huge numbers. And bearing in mind that uh, the, the Minister for uh, Health not so long ago told us, told us that the health um, uh, services and the health facilities are overwhelmed. Though he says they have, they have not been ran, ran over, but I mean, we're talking about huge numbers. And this tells us that if we don't manage the numbers as they are now, and they keep increasing by the day, then we are staring at a very, very serious situation. So There's that one probably step. explains one of the reasons why people are yearning for lockdown. But even, even so, Jamila, yes. whether we have a lockdown or we don't have a lockdown, as long as we don't observe basic um, uh, uh, measures, then the lockdown will not make any sense. Because yeah. there's one thing, Joe, I'm sorry, there's one thing that Kituku said in his story, uh, Gashu, that I need to repeat. He said in Kiambu, out of 50 people were tested, 49 were positive. That's 90%. 98%. Yeah, positivity. Yeah, and, and, and that really is, 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 not, is not good. It's not good at all. Huh? Wow. Uh, interesting that Francis is saying people are yearning for lockdown. Like, we can't do this for ourselves. Please come and do it for yeah. us. That's... But, but anyway, I think we need to move on because, uh, up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of things are happening. Um, so today, the deputy president speaking to Radio Citizen said some interesting things as we get into these political conversations. And I want us to just get, uh, uh, there's a soundbite where he was talking about his relationship with the ODM leader, Raila Odinga. Uh, who I think for the first time in a long time he referred to in those specific terms as opposed to Yamawa and Dawili and those kinds of things. The water baba kikuja na seme tuko tayari kufanya kazi na hasla. Mimi nataka ni kueleze. Mtu yeyote kama hako tayari kushirikiana za sisi katika harakati hii ya kufukuza umaskini na kufukuza ukosefu wa kazi kupitia kwa mpango huu ambao tuko nao the new economic model ya Kenya kila mtu anakaribishwa 
kwa sababu nia yetu ni kuunganisha wa Kenya. Hapo kila mtu tuna, tuna, tuna tu, tuko tayari kushirikiana na kila mtu ambaye ako na nia hiyo. Na e, watu wengi wanaona ya kwamba niko na e, tofauti ya e, kimawazo na na former prime minister. Yes. Haya ni tofauti ya kisiasa. Mm-hmm. Lakini mahali ninakubaliana na former prime minister. Yeye kama vile mimi tunaamini katika chama ya kitaifa. Okay. Ya? Yeah? Wenza, wenza, wenzake wale wengine hawaamini katika chama ya kitaifa. Wao wanaamini kwenda tafuta kwenda tafuta kabila yako, tengeneza chama ya kabila yako, alafu utafute mtu mwingine ametengeneza chama ya kabila yake, alafu utafute mwingine ametengeneza chama ya kabila yake, muungane, mufanye ukarabati. Mimi hapo sipo kwa sababu mimi ninaamini na nimeona vile chama ya kitaifa inaweza kubadilisha nchi. Hmm. Wow, uh, Linus, this looks like a major shift. For, for the first time he's not only the, the, the terms in which he refers to, to, to the ODM leader, but I think even in terms of attempting to decouple him from the rest of this uh, team that has been revolving around the president, around this handshake and so on and so forth, and basically saying, well, for him he has um, uh, a national outlook like myself, but those other guys, that was a very interesting one. I mean, I just picked it out and I thought, we haven't had this in in a long time if at all because election time in kenya brings the best of gymnastics from <laughs> politicians <laughs> and we will see a lot of mm. interesting things because the prize is power 2022 is not too far away in the quest for political power in kenya any vehicle any person anything that can move is attractive. This is not a position of principle. Look, that the deputy president today is calling uh, Rail Odinga former prime minister. It would normally in, the, in public rallies be into a vitenda wili, yule jama. So this sounded uh, suspiciously respectful today because there is an alliance and there is a target which is power in. Uh, 2022. And let's look, I mean, open it up and even go to the uh, handshake itself. When you look at the sound bites of President Uhuru Kenyatta in 2017, when you look at sound bites of Raila Odinga in 2017 and 2013, what these politicians say about each other, the language they use against each other. I mean, if you played for them, the archives, in the middle of the handshake, it'll be a very, very contrasting uh, position. I mean, if the DP today met his own sound bites very recently at the height of political power with Jubilee, it looks very, very different. But the prize is next year. And when it comes to elections, Kenyan politicians can go into an alliance with the devil itself. It doesn't matter. If they can get them there, it is fine. You know what this reminded me of? Remember 2013? Um, the Jubilee Alliance of URP and TNA is launched at Jivanji Gardens. And there was a vice president who had been left comatized, we would say. You know, Mike Kibaki never gave his vice president any brief that Sasanta Kuacha when they were... Ujipange. Uh, Ujipange. And Kalonzo Musyoka found himself in a very difficult uh, situation in 2013. What did he do? He shifted and turned up, and we saw him at, at, uh, on the steps of KICC supporting Raila Odinga. Compare Kalonzo Musyoka of 20, 2013, and the Kalonzo Musyoka went into a pact with uh, Mwai Kibaki so that he becomes vice president at the height of uh, political violence in 2007, 2008. So the problem, and, 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 and let, let me conclude it this way, uh, Joe, my, my long answer. The problem is the absence of principle in our politics. So it's um, the alliances will not be informed by any principles. It will be informed by convenience. 
will this work for us next year if we got if we got politician A and B together, if Raila Odinga and uh, uh, William Ruto go together, what will the numbers look like? Uh, by the way, on that, again, the, 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 the answer is that can be a very, very strong political alliance, no doubt. So it's not about the principle of we disagreed. This, I didn't want this guy to be president in 2013. I fought him to uh, tooth and nail in 2017. What makes Raila Odinga attractive, attractive for an alliance with Uhuru, uh, sorry, with uh, William Ruto in 2022. Politics of convenience, no principles at all. Um, uh, uh, before, uh, Joe, before, before um, I know Gashu will come in and. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'd like to look at it in terms of now how the fortunes have been for the deputy president in, in recent weeks uh, and months. Before that, I remember the hustler narrative came into the picture and he was having all these political meetings and looked like it was a movement. And we even mentioned it here that he's trying to do something different that may work because we said there are hustlers in each and every part of this country. And then came the Msambweni uh, by-election where the candidate that he supported won. And it looked like this wave was actually a eh, going somewhere. And then come this string of defeats. In We can look other than London Ward. We can look at all the other by-elections. We've had several because of the COVID-19 pandemic and we've lost quite a few leaders. We've had uh, by-elections and his candidates or his support, the candidates he supports have lost. In fact, the most recent one was the one in Machakos uh, during the senatorial by-election where the UDA candidate was soundly beaten. And then we can even go back to look at BBI, BBI the discussion and in the counties and we had expected a bit more, a bigger fight uh, in terms of now those who support the, the, the document, but it was almost smooth sailing throughout, even in Rift Valley, um, a part of the country that is seen as where he gets his biggest support. And all this, looking at it, seems to, as you said, polit uh, convenience, politics is convenience. Who is the person who ca I can be with to be able to go to the next step? Who would have thought after 2018, when Raila Odinga was sworn in as the people's president, that a few short months later, him and the president would have the handshake and there'd be bosom buddies. Anything can happen in politics. And I think Kenya, this history has taught us that foes, former foes become best friends in a day or two. So a day is very long in politics in Kenya. And I think for the deputy president, he's trying to play his cards right now, looking at where he can fall. But, but, but Francis, it does appear that something or shall we say several parts, fundamental parts of our politics are beginning to move mm -hmm. uh, in response to an election that is, that is coming up, both within the context of what's happening around the president and this constellation of uh, all kinds of leaders that he put around himself and, and what's beginning to unravel over there. And then the deputy president's own uh, ideas about 2022. I mean, I've seen, for example, the last couple of days, a very interesting trend, almost kind of uh, resonating with what he was saying there. Mm -hmm. You've seen the, the likes of um, Elgeo Marakwet, Senator Kipchumba Murkomen, all of them referring to this other um, uh, alliance that we will talk about shortly in, in not very flattering terms, but saying that, you know, as far as they're concerned, the only person they can take seriously in that whole arrangement is Raila Odinga. And they've been saying that repeatedly. And then comes uh, this rather, as Kai Kai says, suspiciously re respectful remarks from, from the DP. Absolutely. And unfortunately, in politics, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And it, it's, it's, it's never anything else other than convenience and interest. I mean, who would have thought that after the 2007 general election and the aftermath that was the political skirmishes, that William Ruto would team up with Uhuru Kenyatta? Who would have thought? Who would have thought that um, after the handshake, uh, I mean, after the 2017 presidential election, hugely contested and even the results nullified by the Supreme Court that Raila Odinga and Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, the president, would team up in that handshake and even drive an agenda to amend the constitution, among other things, through the Building Bridges Initiative. So the more things change, the more they remain the same. And here we are presented with a scenario in 2022 where there will be no incumbent. So call it a clean page, so to say, where People are looking at it in this way. If you can merge your forces with so and so, then you can easily get the ultimate prize that is the presidency. And so here you have a scenario where one alliance is 
oscillating around the four uh, party leaders, that is Kanus, ANCs, Ford Kenyas, and Wipers. And on the other hand, three of those guys were in a coalition with Raila Odinga, the ODM leader. And if you saw the statement from the ODM Secretary General, um, uh, Edwin Sifuna, today, he's talking about an alliance that will be a tsunami. And it will have fresh blood. Is that fresh blood, Muhisa Kitui, Kivuda Kibwana? Um, you know, are, are, are they part of the, the team? If they are, is it a replacement for Moses Wetangula, Kalonzo Musioka, and, uh, and Musalia Mudavadi? So quite a number of uh, cards will be, you know, moved and shuffled around. And eventually, we may end up, in my thinking, with three coalitions next year. Um, one oscillating around um, uh, the Kalonzo, Mudavadi, Gideon, and, uh, and uh, Wetangula. And if Rael Odinga still vies, he will have his own coalition. And then the deputy president will have another team on the other hand. So what if you end up with a three horse race, so to say? And by so doing, you're also talking about the um, provisions on how to get to state house. 50% plus one, 25% in at least 24 counties. By so doing, do you deny a first round winner? Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, do you trigger a, um, a runoff? And of, obviously that will be a runoff between number one and number two. Yeah. So is it also a possibility that one coalition will be a partner to another coalition, but they run together um, as opposing camps, friendly fire of sorts, so that you trigger a certain desired outcome and eventually trigger a runoff that will be a friendly runoff. Those are some of the things that I have in mind. Wow, but, but, but Lina's one question that we must ask, where is Raila Odinga in all of these things? I mean, initially he was uh, um, everywhere with President Uhuru Kenyatta. As a matter of fact, uh, he sounded more enthusiastic about the handshake and its product, BBI, and all that. Uh, a lot more than even the president, some people said. And now, um, uh, fine, he's, he's been recuperating since, since, since he came out of hospital and all of that. So we haven't heard much from him. But but something is definitely happening around uh, this handshake insofar as Raila Odinga uh, and his position in, in that entire grouping uh, is concerned. And that's something you are talking about, Joe, is the election date is drawing nearer. Mm -hmm. And when election date comes close, then clarity starts coming up also among the political players. Because then you'll start asking, between the handshake and 2022, which of this should I be uh, pursuing? And the noises and the disquiet we've seen uh, within ODM about the, the handshake, in my view, have everything to do with the 2022. Because the handshake, and I think we've said it here before, the handshake was expected to be a political alliance. Uh, Francis, you normally say in politics there is no free lunch. Mm -hmm. And that handshake was supposed to deliver not just this BBI, but also a political path forward that takes care of the players that include uh, Raila Odinga. Uh, but we're also aware that Raila Odinga uh, has been out of uh, public circulation because of health reasons, uh, uh, COVID-19, and um, it's, it's at home recovering. That has also had an, an effect on the physical activities uh, that he used to, uh, to undertake. But I want to just comment on what Francis was talking about, new blood. Um, from 1992 uh, all the way to 19, uh, 2002, when we had uh, our first change of um, um, political uh, parties in power, when Khan was removed by, uh, by the National Rainbow Coalition, New blood is only a theory. It, it, it's thrown up there, but there's never new blood. What we see is a political dialysis, where politicians really renew their, their, their own blood and they start looking new. Who won the presidency in 2002? I remember the, the, the feeling in the streets was that of uh, a Mandela of Kenya, uh, when Mwai Kibaki be, uh, be, uh, defeated Uhuru Kenyatta of the, of the Kanu party. Who was Mwai Kibaki? New blood? No. 
Mwai Kibaki was for 10 years the vice president of 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 Kanu party he of the mugumo tree analogy he of the mugumo tree analogy no less so kenyans somehow are condemned to the same fate where you pick your old politician the, the guy who has always been around and paint them um afresh give them the colors you want and the politicians know this works which is why every election year and you've seen it uh, starting today maybe we could play that um, uh, launch of the one uh, kenya alliance mm -hmm. this is what we see every election year especially when the 10-year cycle comes uh, to an end maybe we could listen to um honorable gideon moy and honorable moses Utangula. Fresh blood from across the border. <laughs> but I think we have it now. I think we have it now. <laughs> okay. Economic hardships that are hurting all of us, the inflationary levels, all these require a unity of purpose. And it is for this reason that we are taking these initial steps to bring the country together under the umbrella of One Kenya Alliance so that we can have a common objective, develop issues of solutions together. We've got candidates in uh, different by-elections which we've all agreed that as One Alliance we are going to pull them out in order to give the Jubilee party a head start and a sure win in those by-elections because Jubilee is part of the One, um, one Kenya Alliance. Look, there'll be more umbrellas towards the election than there'll be raindrops. <laughs> uh, because that is how we approach elections. And it's also a statement about the weak state of our political party um, uh, situation. We don't really have strong parties. Um, if we were to talk of the ideal, the huge impact this team would make is if they fold up their parties. Take the honest, if you really agree, if there's nothing that separates you, um, join one party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let one, one Kenya be a party and not an umbrella. Because these umbrellas, look at the umbrella called uh, NASA right now. There's a lot of noise about that. And there was some reference by Honorable Kalonzo Musioka there and, and, and an exchange with the, um, with the Secretary General of, of, of ODM. Because these umbrellas mean nothing. They're just mere vehicles to that purpose of winning the election. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, um, and, it normally just and, and it's, it fizzles out. It's interesting what you say, Linus, because look, I mean, if you look at our political parties, the way they're structured, even those four gentlemen who are standing there, if you were to really look at it critically, they are speaking. It's really not their parties. I mean, if the parties were to exist, you'd expect the party has structures, mm -hmm. you'd have some meeting. Do you endorse our arrangement with WIPA or with KANU or whatever? And there'll be a whole party process going on. But right now, what are we seeing? We see all these uh, political parties across the board, not just the four. All of them just keep, uh, you know, reaching out to other people and saying, as a party, we are going to work with this one. Like, the party is actually the person. That is why today, if a party leader leaves and goes to the next thing, that party, if the party leader had such clout, the party actually becomes a shell. A shell. So, so we have a situation where political parties exist only in name. But it's interesting uh, f that we seem to be caught in a rut, um, uh, and I think I'll go to you, Jamila, first, that if you look at the four gentlemen uh, that we have just been watching, and the deputy president, and probably Raila Odinga, that beyond that even when you hear Kenyans speak, it's almost as if we are stuck with this bunch of politicians who have been around for some time, and there's almost no sense that there can be something new. You almost see as if our political space is so bereft of imagination. Mm -hmm. There is no 
thought that we can actually have something outside of these five or six gentlemen and I stress gentlemen because they always They're seem no ladies, to be men yeah. and, and that is it and that is a, I think a national tragedy it, it's lack of imagination I think at a critical level <laughs> um, Joe before before Ugashiri speaks I think we need something to come and muddy the waters I don't know what it would be to just come and ch change our whole outlook because we are almost 50 million people who says we do not have other people who can and they keep saying country. fresh ideas and fresh ideas Zikwapi. i don't know why we do not want to experiment as kenyans because if it, it's not like the people we have or the leaders we've had in the also years have really made a difference in our lives kenyans are not happy with how things are going they're not happy with the economy they're not happy with how their day-to-day -day lives are and they wish for change but how will there be change if we have the same leaders um time and time again. What is different? We've had coalitions again and again. These same leaders who are, uh, who are going into coalitions have done it again. Just before elections, as we always say, parties are vehicles for elections. We've seen it again and again. And someone told me that if you don't have a coalition with you, you'll have a coalition against you. So you better form a coalition so that you're not left alone out there in, in, in the rain and in the cold. You want somewhere to, to land. And people say it's just interest that drive most of these politicians. Most of them have been in positions of power. Most of them were meonja ukoka at kaserikali and how good it is to be there. And the whole thing is trying to go back there. People say, I don't think it's our interest that they look out for. That's why people should vote for leaders who they think are out for their interest. We've had people vote in leaders who are not even running on, 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 on who they feel are people who can make a difference in their lives. We've had independent candidates, trans, uh, candidates who are running in parties that are deemed to be popular in particular areas. People can make a difference. Pick people who think will make a difference because they're ones who current, we currently have. I know Gashuri is smiling <laughs> because he's going to pour water on my, <laughs> on my thoughts, but I think it's time we just try and change the whole game. Well, uh, the interesting thing is that um, if we were to look at politics in a straight line, it would yield the nice results that Jamila I you're want. talking about. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's not a straight line as, as we look at it. Look at how the nature of our politics and how it keeps mutating. Um, yesterday's friends are today's foes. And yesterday's foes are today's friends. And the next discussion that you will see, unfortunately, because the nature of our politics is still quite ethnic based. Um, even the numbers that you see, even when you see groupings of politicians, it is the game of numbers that, that, that you look at. Um, because there's always this tendency to think, if A, B, C, and D unite, mm -hmm. how, what are their numbers? And what will be their opponent's numbers? As opposed to, what are the principles? What are the policies? What are the ideas that Team A has as opposed to Team B. Um, much as we will hear very rosy things being said by various politicians, we will do this, we intend to do this, this is our outlook, these are our policies, this is our manifesto. But ultimately, the mobilization will be quite regional. And not so, in, in, a very, in, a, in a very short time, you will see how the arithmetic will start being worked. And then secondly, the ultimate um, uh, question will be, now that a, B, C, and D are uniting. So A will be asking, so what do I get out of this? Yeah. What do I become? What is my share in this, in this team? And when that, once that discussion begins, you will see cross, do I say cross coalition movements? Um, if A feels in this team, I wanted this and it has not been granted, they will easily shift from this team to another team where they think they can get what they're looking for. So even what you see today, even the coalitions that, um, <laughs> I like what uh, Linus is calling them, umbrellas. <laughs> Somebody will feel under this umbrella, I'm not well covered uh, or well shielded from the rain. So I think I can see some space in the other umbrella. Let me try and run there. And so you will see a lot of cross um, coalition, cross alliance uh, movements. Because some guys will be asking, so what do I stand to gain? And I think ultimately, some fundamental questions will be asked. For example, if we were to look at um, the team of Kalonzo, Mudavadi, uh, Gideon, and uh, Wetangula, so who becomes what? Who becomes the presidential candidate? Who becomes the running mate? And in the event BBI passes, who becomes the prime minister? Who becomes the deputy prime ministers? And in the event it doesn't pass, so who becomes the president? Who doesn't become the president? And, and, and so who moves to which team? On the other hand, uh, Raila Odinga, William Ruto, if they were to unite, um, uh, William Ruto cannot vie for 
cannot be Raila's running mate. He has already served his two terms as deputy president. So the only position he can seek in that, t in that alliance is the presidency. Can Raila Odinga be William Ruto's running mate? Question one. And if, for example, there was, um, there was the BBI was to pass and there's a prime minister, who between them would be the prime minister? So those are some of the fundamental questions that we'll keep and, imagining and, and, and as we move BBI on. And you bring BBI and I want us to, to go there because we are about to finish this. I mean, we've seen over the last couple of days, BBI essentially running into some serious headwinds, at mm -hmm. least seemingly so, because in parliament we have this standoff, the, 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 that um, Justice Legal Affairs Committee essentially deadlocked the committee not tabling the report, all these suggestions that they want uh, some clauses or whatever parts of that BBI thing amended. And then you have all these people on the other side who are saying, well, you know, this thing, you can't change anything. The same way the MCS couldn't change anything, Parliament wouldn't. And, you know, someone as senior as James Orengo, the CIS senator, um, yesterday uh, basically saying, look, Parliament's role cannot just be ceremonial. And that there is a potential um, uh, spanner in the works, as it were. And at the same time, we still have those uh, seven or is it eight court cases that have been consolidated, yes, but they are pending there because there's been a hearing. The ruling has not been given. And Linus, we are getting into a situation where the election calendar is ticking and the election date is cast um, uh, in, in, in stone, if you like. Is it 9th of August? Yeah, 9th next, of August. Next year. The second Tuesday of it August. Can, it, can, it cannot move. At least that is what the Constitution says. So could we get to a point where it just becomes untenable, practically impossible, to have BBI, considering all the other issues that will need to be done before actually we go to a referendum, if it came to that? The, the process of changing a constitution is, is a very solemn one uh, and ought to be a very solemn one. In fact, ideally, it ought to be the only political conversation that a country is engaging in at that particular time. But here is a scenario where BBI is struggling for attention with succession politics. And uh, you would see the players and you see the politicians now focusing more on 2022. So there is a lot of noise. There is a lot of noise because um, people are looking at the post um, August next year, the first Tuesday of next year, and uh, they're not looking, they, they, they're looking at this BBI and saying, who will carry it? And this is really heavy on the, on the shoulders of um, the promoters of, uh, of BBI. Um, there are a number of things, and you've not added to that this whole scenario, the COVID-19 uh, complex. You see, public rallies keep those political conversations mm -hmm. uh, really going. They give it oxygen. And uh, now that you don't have political gatherings, there is also a gap in as far as the conversation about uh, BBI is concerned. The disquiet we are talking about between the handshake partners, what does that also mean for uh, the, the fate That's of BBI? Huge. It's huge. Suddenly you have BBI proponents talking of mm -hmm. the possibility of amending uh, the bill. You read Article 257 and you wonder, but at what, where do you want to, to, to bring in that amendment? Because once uh, 257 kicks in, the bill goes as is. You are supposed to have negotiated at the drafting stage before you take it, before you collect the one million signatures and before you take it to the IEBC. Once it goes to IEBC, then it's on, on the trolley already and moving. It can only move from one stage to another. I don't know what amendments they are talking about. When I hear amendments, I hear politics. Mm -hmm. Actually, well, but one of them actually was saying, uh, I was speaking to somebody who was saying that the fact that it is a bill and it is going through parliament presupposes, at least according to that school of thought, that it is going to go through the normal processes of parliament, which include committee stage, all these public mm -hmm. participation things. And but then at the, the end of the day, yeah. whatever product of that process then is what becomes uh, what goes to the referendum or not that is that school of thought which as you say 
Uh, probably is debatable, but it is there and it is what is actually driving a lot of what we are hearing from some very senior members of the House, including someone like James Orengo, who is not only a senior advocate in this country, but also in the parliamentary leadership and a key player in the the handshake side of things and, and, and also in ODM. Remember for politicians, whether they have a legal background or not, <laughs> they can dress uh, arguments with their political purpose. And you can use politics to, mm -hmm. uh, to do that. There's an attorney general, no names here, that used to tell one president, no names again, that this is what the law says, but what do you want? Because then he'll explain to them, if, if you tell me what you want, and, and, and the law will say what, the, what, what, what you are saying. Uh, what we have not been hearing from pol politicians, and in this whole debate, is the difference between the, um, the popular initiative and the parliamentary initiative. Mm -hmm. If this was a parliamentary initiative, they could sit and take it through those uh, uh, processes, Francis. But this is a popular initiative. The popular initiative, in my view, presupposed that it will be some wananchi somewhere, uh, wanjiku. What Jamila was talking about, you upset with the political arrangements as they are. So do a popular initiative of amending the constitution. The popular initiative in Article 257 did not suppose that it is politicians and members of parliament who will come using it. That was a trolley for somebody else. That was a trolley for um, for maybe civil society. That was a trolley for uh, Wanjiko. But here is a popular initiative driven for all uh, argument purposes by the political classes. It's driven by MPs who are the promoters. An MP and an ex-MP. <laughs> and then a super promoters, president, former prime minister. How popular is this? This is more of a parliamentary and more of a political uh, than a popular initiative. And, and, but there's one, one other thought as, as we finish. I mean, I've also heard people say that um, the BBI is in a really difficult place because for as long as there is that disagreement within uh, that coalition, uh, loose as it is, that the president has been running with after the handshake, then these uh, grievances might actually find their way into the BBI. So that when you hear certain members, for example, of ODM saying, oh, we need to amend this thing, and then you have uh, people like Emos Kimunya basically saying, no, 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 this thing cannot be amended, that in a sense they might be seeking to express those grievances that are coming from perceived betrayal of, of, of Raila Odinga and, 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 and in a sense use this BBI as a platform for that. Add to that the fact that there were actually things that um, uh, certain members of ODM felt were not properly addressed in the BBI. Mm -hmm. For example, the issue of the 70 constituencies. I know for a fact that there are leaders, for example, from Nyanza who feel that uh, their location of, uh, in the 70 new seats uh, wasn't quite fair according to them that uh, Nyanza for example which is uh, been a key proponent and, and, and the leaders from there pushing BBI, BBI very very hard didn't quite get uh, the seats that they were looking for so that there might be almost like a backdoor route trying to get some of the things that they did not get uh, from that um, initial process of the BBI. Spot on Joe. Um, look at it this way. What we are seeing in Parliament today is not a surprise because even before the bill left uh, the handshake team or the BBI team, there were some questions. Um, for example, the IBC question, the recruitment of uh, IBC commissioners and so on and so forth. Those are some of the interesting things that we had and there were concessions that were made at that stage, even before the bill went to IBC, before it went even to the county assemblies. There are some things that either side of the handshake wanted but didn't get in that in that um, in that final document and you remember how certain things kept changing you know there's some the first document the second document the final document you will see quite some changes and so is it possible to ask a hypothetical question for anyone who was not satisfied with the document as it left the bbi team and went to the county assemblies is it then therefore 
a scenario where one person or two people or any team that is not happy with the document as it left the handshake team and went to the county assemblies, now that it has come to the National Assembly and the Senate, is it an opportunity that has been seen to force in some of the things that or some of the concessions that were not granted in that pre uh, process previously. I would say probably that is a scenario. But now the question is, if you were to open up the document at parliament level, how much of it would you open up? Because would it then invite a scenario where anybody who was not satisfied, pr probably let's say with the question of the ombudsman would say, for me to support, remove the ombudsman. Now, the number of constitu constituencies, the 70, the 70 constituencies, is it a scenario where one team or either side of the handshake would ask for redistribution of the seats? And is it also possible some few interesting things would be added, others removed? And what then becomes of the debate that we saw in the county assemblies? Because MCAs were told, pass this document as is. You cannot change anything. So then one would ask, what is the difference then in the National Assembly and the Senate? Why were the MCAs who did public participation in some counties and heard what some of the residents were saying, what, what became of the suggestions that came from the um, from the wards uh, before the debate and the vote in the county assemblies. What became of those ideas, the views, the, 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 the suggestions? And how are they not, why were they not added? Uh, why were they not considered? But they now ought to be considered at the National Assembly level and the Senate level. So some very fundamental questions need to be asked uh, as at that level. Because if it is an opportunity to reopen the document, why was that opportunity denied to the MCAs at the county assemblies? Finally, and, 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 and Francis, yeah. where is that opportunity coming from? Because the Constitution 257 doesn't have those opportunities. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say, now after passing the one million, uh, if, once it comes back from IBC and goes to MCAs, you can insert something. Because it's a popular initiative, it's supposed to be a complete document, then walks all the 11 stages of Article uh, to uh, 57 as is. The only answer that is being sought for in this whole process is yes or no. Do you agree with this document as is or do you reject it as is? You see, it's a, it's a, give, it's a, it's a give and take kind of a scenario. When the document go to where it is now, either side of the handshake agreed to seed some and take some take some and seed some. So that being the scenario, if you were to reopen the document at the National Assembly level and the Senate level, then you would have to open it up for all those who are interested in the process. Because we've had questions raised by the civil society, by the religious organizations, by various political leaders, various interests and stakeholders in this process. So what, become, it, what becomes of their views? And secondly and finally, because mm -hmm. I can see Joe uh, doing this, yeah. Masai Mekimbia, um, I'm looking at the timeline that came out. You remember that timeline for a referendum in August? Is it still tenable? We are at the tail end of March. So between now and June, we're talking about April and May, two months. We have court cases that are yet to be ruled on, and the litigants still have an opportunity to go to the Court of Appeal and to go to the Supreme Court. Yeah, mm -hmm. That also buys a bit of time. Um, and the standoff that we see in Parliament, how soon can it be resolved? Because as is now, the IEBC says it cannot prepare for a referendum until that court order is is no is 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 cleared so there are quite a number of things that will be um, clear as we move on with the bbi process and uh, maybe at one point you will see some adjustments in terms of the timelines and the process thereof but, Joe, but we I, have just, to I just wanted to speculate very quickly on uh, what, what uh, francis posed there when it comes to this issue of reopening the document if you reopen, mm -hmm. which will be an illegality if you are to follow 257 strictly. A lot of people think that the whole thing has been illegal. You remember this? <laughs> yeah. that yeah. much yes. Of yes. yes. <laughs> and, and somebody who, who, who was part of the one million signatures goes to court and tells the high court, mm -hmm. uh, judge, that is not the document I signed. It's not the document that I approved to be taken to IBC. Because this popular initiative presupposes you are rewriting or amending or or, 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 or uh, changing the constitution the moment you raise those one million signatures and handing over the bill to the IBC. 
And, and, I, and, I th and, and I think you can't put it past uh, uh, whoever it is that that could be the idea so that the thing goes on and on and on forever. But I think bottom line is that this is really the first popular initiative that has gone this far. Remember there was a, the Okoa Kenya, Kenya, which they said the signatures mm -hmm. had cows and other things and it didn't go beyond that. Then we had the Punguza Mzigo, which went... Uh, I think to county assemblies and, and, and that kind of thing. Then now we have this one that has gone all the way to parliament. So this is the first experience that parliament is having with a popular initiative. And secondly, the whole question of a referendum law that mm -hmm. kind of spells out certain things about how this bill leaves and how it goes and all that. So we are basically dealing with uncharted territories here. And then there's a real possibility that parliament can actually change something and then say, well, let's change it and see what happens and we could be in in extremely uncharted territory and i think true joe also look at one fundamental thing that we, to go. yeah that we must that we must not lose sight of even in the event that the bbi bill has passed and we've gone to a referendum and it has been approved by by kenyans hypothetically there are some things that will require some questions for example you heard what the ibc chairman told the joint uh, committees of parliament right. that the, it will take some time to d deal with the boundaries delimitation. and delimitation and creation of the 70 new constituencies. That is another very complex question. And remember, you're going to a general election in under 16 months yes. and you have to delimit boundaries, you have Civic to create new constituencies, you have to deal with a voter register for each of those words, each of those constituencies. And he hasn't started. And it hasn't started. And so tells you that there are quite a number of things that need to happen. And if the court cases are there and all this manner of things that we see, then you have some serious questions to deal with. We are done. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, this is when I say we are taking this home. And you're gagging LK at the I, same I'm time. I'm gagging him completely. <laughs> Uh, we're taking this home, it's and I think tonight, a popular initiative. <laughs> Let's start with uh, a game. <laughs>